Now that we can make slightly more complicated enemies with states and we've got a player object, it's time for our enemies to be able to detect the player. Hello everyone, this is Sam Spade, and in this tutorial, I'm going to briefly go over some basic collision functions built into GameMaker, and then we're going to take our big crusher enemy and update it so that it tries to smash the player, rather than just smashing down after a certain amount of time. GameMaker provides us a variety of built-in collision functions. And as with every function, we need to consider what inputs the function takes, what it does, and what it returns. For collision functions, this means paying special attention to how it checks for collisions, specifically what it checks using and what it checks against. And to help us out with this, we have a very helpful cheat sheet on the GameMaker community forms. This whole thing is worth reading, but I'm gonna focus on the summary table right here. I'm not gonna go through all of the functions, but I am gonna go through these standard four as they are the most common functions and can serve as an example for reading the rest of the cheat sheet. Let's start with place meeting, which as we talked about in an earlier tutorial, checks for collision functions using sprites or more accurately their masks. For it to work, both the object that is calling the function and the object or instance of an object that you're checking need to have collision masks set up. And this function will return true or false. Instance place is very similar to place meeting. It checks using a mask, just like place meeting, and it checks against a mask, just like place meeting. But instead of returning true or false, it returns either an instance ID or no one. This distinction between these two functions is very important to keep in mind. You wanna use place meeting for true or false, but instance place if you need an instance ID. Position meeting and instance position are counterparts to place meeting and instance place, except that they check a point against a mask rather than a mask against a mask. So you should use the position version if you are checking a point and the place version if you are checking with a mask. And just like the place functions, you have a version that returns the instance ID and a version that returns true and false. And again, you want to keep these in mind. Once more, I would recommend reading this whole tutorial, but for now, let's update our enemy. Our original crusher had the following state machine. It would go from wait to fall after the alarm fired. Our new crusher will be almost identical, except that it will switch from the wait state to the falling state only if it detects the player. And there are many ways we could check for the player, but to start with, we're going to use the built-in function collision line. So if we switch over to the manual, and you should always, always review unfamiliar functions in the manual, we can see that it takes seven arguments. The first four are the line coordinates. You have X and Y to start and X and Y to end. Then it takes an object or instance ID. And remember that for these functions that take an object or instance ID, if you give it an instance ID, it will only check against that instance. But if you give it an object ID, it will check against all instances, not only of that object, but all instances of any children of that object. Finally, you also need to specify whether or not to use precision with the masks we will not, and whether or not to include or exclude the calling instance. But this will only matter if the instance is checking against its own object type. So the way we're gonna use this collision function is by specifying a collision line straight down from our enemy. So if any instance of our player object crosses this line right here, it'll switch from the waiting state to the falling state. So let's switch over to GameMaker. I've renamed our original crusher enemy, object crusher auto. This is the crusher that operates on the timer. I've duplicated it and then renamed the duplicate object crusher lurker. This will be the enemy that we're working with in this tutorial. We don't need to make any changes to its create event. Its create event will be identical. In fact, if we pull these two enemies up, we can see that it has very similar events, except that the lurker enemy doesn't need alarm zero. Alarm zero was what switched the crusher from the wait state to the fall state. Since we're now doing that by detecting the enemy, we don't need that alarm zero anymore. I could have renamed this alarm zero, and I might have in a real project, but just to keep the similarities clear, I didn't renumber my alarms. And you can see that the alarms for both of these enemies are still the exact same. So let's look at the step event of our lurker. Its falling state is gonna be exactly the same as it used to be, and its rising state is also going to be identical, at least for now. The only real change is in the waiting state. If we look at the waiting state for our original crusher enemy, the one that relies on alarm zero, we can see that the only thing in the waiting state 
is that it sets alarm zero to room speed times three or three seconds if it's not set already. This is our exit from our waiting state. Now in our waiting state, we are implementing our collision line. We're doing a check to see if any instance of the player parent exists. And if so, we're doing that collision line check. Our first point is the X and Y of our object, of our enemy. We are then checking for X and Y plus room height. This will create a line straight down. If we switch over to our room here, you can imagine a line going from here down here to room height. We are checking for a collision with player parent. We are not using precision and we are excluding the calling object, though again, it doesn't actually matter since in this case, it is a different object. But the one thing that I really want to stress here is notice what we're comparing it against. We are not using true or false because collision line doesn't return true or false. Collision line returns either an instance ID or if there is no collision, the keyword no one. So we can check for false by saying not equal to no one. If this is true, so there is a collision line, then we can switch our state to falling. And that's really it. So if we run this, you can see that I have a player object. The player object can move around and jump just like before. And the crusher enemy is not falling unless the player object goes underneath it. At which point the crusher enemy acts exactly as before, because again, the falling state and the rising state are exactly what we used to have. They have not been changed. So now let's make one improvement to our crusher. Currently, it always switches into a falling state, and this would be true even if there was something like a platform in the way. We can fix this by adding a second collision line. We don't need to do this, of course. Maybe this is the behavior that you want, but it could look a little weird. So we have our crusher and its collision line checking for the player. Now we will add a second collision line, and this second collision line will go from the crusher to the player, and it will check for a collision with any solid parent. If it finds a collision, then it will know that there is something between them and we won't switch our state. However, if there is a collision with the player and no collision with the solid parent between the player and the crusher, then it will know it is safe to try to crush the player. So we can come in here to our check. We can copy our collision line function and now make this if statement an and. We'll have the first collision check and the second collision check. Now for this collision line, we want our starting point to be the same, but we want our ending point to be the player. And so that will be player parent X and player parent Y. And I want to note that this code is a good idea if and only if there's only ever one player parent present at a time. Then we're going to check for whether or not there's a solid parent. And now this one we want to be equal to no one because again, we don't want there to be a collision. And that's really it. I've already added a platform to the room. So let's run this. So now if our player goes underneath the platform, nothing can be triggered. But if our player comes up here, the crusher will try to hit the player. The first variation I want to try is what if we have this check in both the waiting and the rising state so that the player can't just sneak under while the enemy is rising. We can actually do this very easily just by copying and pasting this code down here. Now this check exists in two different places. But if you remember from our refactoring episode, this is actually a poor way to do it. Instead, we should create a function. In fact, what would be really nice to be able to do would be to write something like if player detected state equals falling, and then to put this in both places. There are probably even better ways to do this, but this is at least an improvement. All we have to do now is write this function. Let's copy the code that it's gonna have and create a method variable called player detected in our create event. We copy the code in, and now we'll simply return true if it passes all the checks and otherwise return false. Let's run this and see if it works. So now you can see that it goes down if we go underneath it, but while it's rising, if we try to go back under it, it again detects the player and tries to crush us. So there you go. We have an enemy that can detect the player using a collision line. And in the next tutorial, we'll expand upon this idea by creating vision cones. Until then, check out the videos down below.